So now we're going to go back and look at this process of how information is integrated in the cell body to produce this output. And this gives rise to this other key point about contrast. So here's this is a little bit technical. This is more detail than you typically will have in a typical introductory psychology course. Uh, but I'm going to try to convey the intuition to you so that you can kind of get a sense of what's going on inside the neuron. So don't worry if you don't get all the details here. Those are not important. You want to get the big picture. And the big picture is that there's a tug of war taking place inside each neuron in your brain. 10 billion neurons. Each of them have this little pitched battle taking place. And the two players in this battle, there's more than just two, but for, for starters, let's just talk about these two players. One is pulling on this kind of rope here. If you've ever done a tug of war, you have two people or, or N people on either side of a rope. They're pulling on either side and they're trying to get that flag to go one way or the other towards their side in particular. And so, um, you know, the flag here is a electrical signal called the membrane potential. And one side is pulling it down, okay, towards the negative direction. And we call that inhibition. And then the other side is pulling it up in the positive direction, and that's known as excitation, okay? And so these little subscripts here, I mean inhibition, and the E means excitation. And the, the, the battle, the pitch here, the, 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 the turf over which they're battling is just this electrical potential. It's the difference in electrical charge inside and outside of the cell, and it's across that membrane which is why we call it the membrane potential or V, which stands for voltage and M, which stands for membrane. And so the little flag that's getting pulled up and down by these excitation and inhibition processes um, is that membrane potential of the cell. That's what gets integrated in the cell body. And there's this critical point here, this theta, which if the membrane potential gets pulled up across that critical threshold, then the cell fires its action potential. And so that's really what's happening. Everything starts out down here at this kind of resting potential, which is at the point where inhibition is sort of pulling the system down. Um, and then uh, if excitation is able to yank that flag up above the threshold, in other words, there's enough of an excitatory signal coming in from those synapses, having detected some interesting pattern out there in the world, that's when the neuron starts to fire an action potential. And it's really the, the speed with which they pull up the excitatory side, pulls up that membrane potential that determines the overall rate of firing of the action potentials. And that's really the ultimate signal that the neuron is conveying. And so uh, you can write out some mathematics. This is all, again, totally you know beyond the scope of what you need to know. I'm just telling you so you can get the full picture of how it works if you're interested. Um, this is uh, Ohm's law for current I is equal to the conductance, which is also known as one over the resistance, in case you knew about resistance. Um, conductance is much more sensible kind of number to be talking about. And the conductance is how big the excitation is. And uh, the, so you have kind of a conductance for in excitation, a conductance for inhibition, and that's equal to the number of kind of channels that are open that allow uh, excitation to flow into the cell or inhibition to flow into the cell. Um, and so G is kind of how big the pipes are. And then you have the driving uh, potential, which is the reversal potential here or the equilibrium potential. Um, this point in this tug of war where the person is actually standing, pulling one way or the other. And so that's really the, the, the key thing. The excitation pulls up because of this particular number here, this, this excitatory driving potential. Um, inhibition pulls down because it has a, a different number and that tells it which way it's pulling relative to the current membrane potential. So there you have it. Uh, really mathematically, you know, it's just uh, multiplication and subtraction. It's really fundamentally pretty basic operations. And that describes exactly what's happening inside the neuron. That's the whole story of how fundamentally inhibition and excitation kind of integrate. So actually, it's not that complicated. And, and maybe you do actually get a sort of a sense of how it works. And the key point 
of all of that is that because these two are kind of in this pitch battle, this tug of war state, the only thing that matters about where, where the neuron goes uh, in terms of this memory potential is the relative strength of inhibition compared to excitation. So in the typical resting state of the cell, you have only inhibition, you don't have any excitation. When a signal comes in and the, and the neuron starts receiving excitation, um, then this excitatory conductance gets bigger. And you know if, in fact, the excitatory conductance is exactly equal to the inhibitory conductance, then, in fact, the membrane potential, according to this relative balance, will be right there in the middle. And it turns out that that middle happens to be above the threshold for firing action potential, so you'll get action potential firing. But the relative principle, the relativity principle, which gives rise to this contrast effect, um, comes about because even if you had less excitation, if you also had less inhibition, then in fact, you would get the exact same value for the membrane potential. And so it isn't about the absolute size uh, of the conductance, it's about the relative size of that conductance. And so for example, these larger conductances may be uh, what operates, what you see in a bright environment where there's lots of stimulus coming in in the visual system. And this lower level here may be what happens in a dark room uh, where you have less excitation coming in. But again, the system can adapt and, and adjust to that, uh, those overall absolute differences because it only cares about these relative differences. Um, and so if something's relatively a little bit brighter than the rest of the scene, that is enough to drive excitation because essentially the inhibition in general reflects kind of the overall average level out there, the background level, and then the excitation is kind of relative to that background level. And this is really the key point, that contrast this relativity principle that the brain only cares about relative levels. How much brighter is some part of the scene that I'm looking at relative to the overall scene, not in some absolute coordinate system. So the same thing happens in the auditory system. We only uh, are very good at judging the relative pitch, for example, of sounds coming in. Is it higher or lower than some other sound? Um, and that's why it's actually really rare for people to have this ability to do absolute pitch judgments to know the actual exact uh, frequency of a sound that we're hearing because our brains are always just judging things on these relative comparisons. And as we talked about before, um, that relativity principle, that contrast effect uh, operates in the social world. We care about how we are doing, how, how, how many friends we have relative to our other friends, how popular is relative to everybody else. And how much as you get older, like how much your salary is not relative to the whole world, but relative to your peer group, who, who you're comparing yourself to. And so everything we do is kind of is relative to our comparison group. And that's actually uh, been shown, for example, that um, the absolute amount of money that you make doesn't matter. In different countries, people make wildly different amounts of money. Um, but happiness associated with, with your income is really a function of how much you make relative to your peer group, right? Relative to your neighbors, et cetera. Um, so this relativity principle applies everywhere. And it comes right down to... Uh, this fundamental property of how individual neurons work um, right there in the in the very innards of your of your neurons. And just for fun, when we I, I make computer models of the brain uh, and I take these equations and I implement these equations in those computer models. Um, and so it literally is just summing up those Ohm's law equations for each different type of channel here, excitatory, inhibitory. There's another mysterious channel called the leak channel. Um, and uh, the membrane potential is driven by those, those currents, those changes in flows of ions coming in. And so our new membrane potential at time T is just our old membrane potential plus some amount of that current, the amount of, uh, to which uh, charge has entered or left the cell. And so if you unpack those two equations, put them together, if you want to have a equation that you can put on a t-shirt that says this is how my brain works uh, kind of like those t-shirts that have like Maxwell's equations on them uh, 
these are the fundamental equations of your mind, okay? Uh, and it's very, very simple equations, okay? Um, so when we run our computer simulations of neurons, we put these in the computer. You can just enter those equations in the computer and it'll calculate them for you. Um, and, and that does a really good job of simulating how neurons behave. 